The Tom Woods Show, episode 577. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you missed our webinar yesterday for Zappable, the replay is available at tomwoods.com slash zap. We had hundreds of people there, and everyone went berserk for this software, which makes it so easy to create beautiful and awesome mobile apps that you can sell to local businesses. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash zap. Hello, everybody. Mark Skousen is joining us today to talk about Austrian economics for investors. And Mark takes a view that's a little bit different from what you've heard from a lot of other investment advisors who are influenced by Austrian economics. So I thought it'd be interesting to get another perspective on some of these questions. We also want to talk about the GDP and gross output numbers and why one is better than the other for understanding what's really going on in the economy. Mark Skousen is an economist, investment analyst, newsletter editor, college professor, and author. He's the author of over 25 nonfiction books. The one that I want to focus on primarily is A Viennese Waltz Down Wall Street, Austrian Economics for Investors. I'll have several of Mark's titles up at tomwoods.com slash 577. He is the editor-in-chief of the financial newsletter Forecasts and Strategies, and he is also the producer of Freedom Fest, the annual gathering in Las Vegas. Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. Nice to be with you. I don't think I'm revealing anything that is not publicly known, but I'm very glad to say that you were in attendance at the debate on Alexander Hamilton between Michael Malice and me, and we had a nice dinner beforehand, and I thought, how can I be on episode 570-something, and I have never had Mark Skousen on the show. It's just an outrage. So this is episode 577 today, and on the show notes page for today, which would be tomwoods.com slash 577, I am going to link to, it's just going to be a Mark Skousen smorgasbord <laughs> of links and books and things to get people up to speed on, on what you've been doing. I want to talk first about an issue in the financial news. It's it's maybe a couple of years old now, but it's very important that you, in a way, kind of had an intellectual hand in, that the, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, which is, you can, it's a government agency, BEA.gov, actually now reports a statistic that, in your view, more fully describes the economy than just simply GDP figures. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's called gross output, or GO, and uh, uh, the way I look at it is it goes beyond, go beyond GDP, because GDP is the measure that since the 1940s, the government, which is the BEA, the Bureau of Economic Analysis, is part of the U.S. Commerce Department, and they are the ones who put out the quarterly GDP statistics. And I've always felt that GDP was a very narrow definition of the economy, it's basically a measure of all the finished goods and services, the final, the value of final goods and services, and it leaves out the entire supply chain that creates these goods. It's it's not unlike uh, uh, a analyst on Wall Street saying, "Well, let's just go to the bottom line. Let's just look at profits, and we'll ignore sales, which is what <laughs> created the profits in the first place." Right, and. You know, you go back a long ways, all the way back to Irving Fisher, who talked about uh, the in the equation of exchange, how uh, you need to measure the volume of trade of, of transactions in the economy. And, and Hayek, uh, who with, uh, in his book, Prices and Production, said, we need to measure the Hayek triangle, the whole structure of production, all the stages of production, the supply chain, as well as the final product. So my idea is to put, with my book, The Structure of Production, in 1990, I came up with the idea of gross output as a actual measure, and I started trying to estimate the measure and so forth. And I found out a number of things. Number one, it's almost double, if not double, what GDP is. And it's also much more volatile, as you would expect, in the earlier stages of production the supply chain is much more volatile than, than final output. And so uh, 
I kept pestering the BEA. I said, you know, you really should have a measure of what we might call top line uh, national income accounting and not just bottom line. Bottom line meaning final output. We need a top line. Uh, I'm using the terms that are often used on Wall Street uh, where they talk about top line revenues and bottom line uh, earnings. And the same thing applies to national income accounting. So you need a top line to measure spending at all stages of production. And in April, starting in April of 2014, they started measuring it. So I consider it a, a tremendous triumph. I mean, imagine you look at all the very few triumphs that Austrian economics and supply side economics has had over the last 40 or 50 years. And this has to be one of them, that, that GO that comes out quarterly now, gross output by the BEA, is in essence a measure of Hayek's triangle. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really uh, delighted that this is the case. And frankly, I think we ought to have a big party celebrating this uh, in honor of Hayek, because as you know, Hayek's macroeconomics and prices and production has been poo-pooed over the years by the Chicago School by the Friedman groups and, and others. And, and I think it's time that we uh, bring it out and, and, uh, and I'm doing everything I can. I just had an article in the uh, Appy journal, the journal of private enterprise that Appy puts out uh, called linking Austrian economics to uh, Keynesian economics, because in essence, gross output is a measure uh, is an Austrian, a supply side measure of the, total economic activity in the production process. And GDP is more or less a Keynesian concept because Keynes always emphasized uh, that final effective demand was more important, uh, was the most important side of it. So in essence, I'm not saying throw out GDP, you keep it, it's part of the program uh, as representing final output, but you need a measure of spending at all stages of production on how you get there. And to my delight, not only is the BEA publishing this every quarter, but it's now being integrated into the textbook. So I just got an email from Roger Leroy Miller, and he's putting it in Economics Today, his top textbook, and McConnell Brew uh, that is being written by Sean Flynn, who, by the way, is running for Congress this year as a Republican, but he's the main writer of the uh, McConnell Brew textbook. And he's, uh, he and I are working together to uh, write chapter 21 of his textbook, which I understand is still the number one textbook in the country. So it's all going to be in these textbooks. And it's a, it's a huge triumph. Uh, a, a big, I think we, we really need to celebrate uh, this tremendous breakthrough and uh, this this weekend, by the way, the BEA is coming out with its uh, latest uh, uh, gross output statistics. So I'll be very interested to see if there's any evidence of the slowdown in the economy that's precipitating this uh, stock market uh, correction or bear market or whatever you want to call it that's going on right now. Let me say a couple of things about what you just said. First of all, not everybody knows APPY as an acronym, so I'll tell, it's, I'll tell everybody it's the Association of Private Enterprise Education. And the other thing is, I, just to make sure people get it, I think you explained very well why what we have with GO is a very Hayekian slash Austrian kind of statistic. But when we're dealing with, with GDP, this is a very uh, Keynesian kind of statistic. And the key thing here is that by leaving out all these intermediate intermediate stages of production all the gross saving that goes in just to maintain the capital structure and all these stages that wouldn't get counted in just simply looking at the final product and the final sale this allows Keynesians to exaggerate the extent to which consumption is at the basis of the economy because they leave out all this other spending by businesses and they say look most of it is consumption spending but actually no uh, you look at it, and actually there's vastly more business spending than people realize because we're excluding it from the official numbers. Am I getting the gist of it? Absolutely. This is what got me started on creating this gross output statistic in the first place because I knew that 
the media were, and the journalists were constantly being misled by the way we explain that GDP is somehow the economy, that it represents all the economy. And when you realize that it leaves out most B2B activity, business to business spending, it leaves out the supply chain that brings about the economy. That's what, that's where most of the business spending is. Economists are constantly uh, focusing just on capital investment and capital goods, which only represents about 18% of the, uh, of the economy. And they leave out all the spending like you, you say, the gross saving that is used to provide the funds to move the production process along, and it's huge. The B2B uh, business spending uh, amounts to like $25 trillion, while consumer spending is only about like $13 trillion. So uh, business spending is, is like almost double what consumer spending is. So whenever... I cringe every time I see in an AP article or uh, on Wall Street anyone saying that consumer spending drives the economy and retail sales are so important. This is the most stable area of the economy. If you look at charts on consumer spending, it hardly ever dips. It just kind of gradually moves up. It's business spending that is volatile and is a much bigger sector of the economy. And it's not just double counting, because that's one of the criticisms I get. Oh, it's just double counting. Well, double counting counts because people, businesses actually writing checks to pay to move this production process along. You can't make a, your business success it cannot be dependent solely on, uh, the, the, on, on profits. You can't, uh, you need money to pay for the entire expenditures uh, of, of, of rent and the supplies and, and uh, employees and all of that sort of thing. Uh, you can't run a business based purely on, on, uh, on the bottom line. It needs to cover the entire expenditures. And of course, it's only double counting depending on what it is you're trying to count. If all you're trying to count is final sales, then it would be double counting. But if you are interested in a deeper understanding of the economy or on a firm-by-firm -firm basis, interested in what you're spending your money on, it's not double counting, and it, and it has to be done. Now, I, I have to talk to you. I want to spend the balance of our time on a subject on which you – this is interesting. I mean you are – an outlier among outliers, which almost makes you mainstream. Like, I don't even know how that works out, <laughs> ultimately. But you are an Austrian investor. You've been a publisher of investment newsletters for, I guess, uh, over 35 years now. And in addition to your many books, you do a lot of commentary on investing and a lot of teaching on investing. And you, you would argue that Austrian School Insights have guided you in, in – the way you've done investing, the way you've taught it, but you have dissented from what you consider to be some of the doom and gloom type of talk that we hear from a lot of Austrian influence investors who will say things like, I don't want to be in the stock market because we all know it's a Fed bubble. And I remember when I saw you in New York, you saying to me, the trouble with that is, even though we know there's artificial activity going on from the Fed, you're going to miss a lot of bull markets if that's your attitude. So I'm very, very interested in this. What What is your corrective to this type of narrative coming from a lot of, let's just say, other newsletter writers. Yeah, and uh, it's true. I am a bit of an outlier, and it really developed in the early 1980s when I was at the New Orleans Conference, which is a conference of gold bugs and doomsdayers and so forth. In fact, I just returned from the New Orleans Conference, and I can't tell you how many people came up to me and said, my portfolio is down 70%. Oh, and I said, how can, how can that be? And he said, well, I kept coming to the New Orleans conference and I went to the exhibitors and they were telling me a great story about their mining company. It turned out to be these penny stocks and they've just been devastated. Gold is down sharply uh, over the last five years. And, um, and these mining stocks, so they were there to double down. I <laughs> just, uh, couldn't realize that they had made uh, made that kind of a serious uh, mistake and didn't use stop orders or any kind of uh, discipline to protect themselves. And so it kind of made me angry that uh, 
they had been listening only to one side of the market, the doomsday market, going back to the early 1980s. When Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980, the New Orleans Conference had like 5,000 people there. I mean, it was the biggest turnout they had ever had. But And I was shocked at how many people were poo-pooing Reagan and so on, saying he won't make any difference and that sort of thing. And there were these doomsday gold bugs. And I recognized almost right away that there had been a sea change and that gold and silver were not going to be the great investments of the future, but the traditional stock and bond markets were. And I turned out to be right. I mean, nobody really believed me particularly, but I, I was kind of, uh, I, I became a little bit of uh, a, a disfellowshipped, if you will, from the hard money movement at that time. And uh, so in my experience, and, and you're right, I am teach, I'm teaching at Chapman University right now, which is uh, in Southern California. It's a great school that Vernon Smith, the uh, free market economist, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist of experimental economics, he's here. And there's a number of other free market people here at Chapman, and I'm teaching financial economics this spring. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion. But my general view is that in the Austrian theory of the business cycle, I think the uh, the Austrians often forget the boom phase of the business cycle. They just focus on the bust. And the reason they focus on the bust is because, as Mises and Hayek pointed out, most of the time the um, expansion phase of the business cycle is somewhat artificial. The Fed has induced easy money policies. It's lowered interest rates, not let the market work properly. And so they always fear that any time in the back of their mind, the stock market could just collapse. And in fact, that's kind of like what it's been doing over the last couple of weeks. Uh, and so uh, they're in their heyday now, and they're coming out of the woodwork uh, with with their, their predictions and they're not just predicting a bear market. They're predicting total collapse of Western civilization. It's very apocalyptic uh, in their approach. They're seeing a financial Armageddon. I personally call it a little bit what I would call financial terrorism uh, by, by these people. And it's a very dangerous thing because they affect in particular retirees. And retirees uh, do have anxiety concerns. I listen to these, these people contact me and they're very upset and they're getting out of the market and they're buying gold. And maybe now's a good time to buy gold, but, but should you put all your money in gold, all your money in gold stocks? I think that's very imprudent, especially when historically over the last hundred years, the two out of every three days of the stock market on average, two thirds of the time stocks are going up, not going down. So I'm going to bet that there, there's two, I'll tell you, I know I've, I've gone on a little bit long, but there's two arguments that I make that I think are underappreciated by the Austrian bears and, and doomsdayers. One is they underestimate the federal government, the Federal Reserve's ability to inject liquidity and stabilize the financial crisis. That's number one. And they've been doing it for 50 years now and gotten away with it. Even 2008, where everybody thought, oh, this is the end. And yet they were able to somehow pull it off. And number two is they underestimate the private sector, major corporations' ability to uh, fix their balance sheets, to become more conservative, uh, to build a cash position, to cut costs, and and then start to look uh, like they, they can weather this next storm a lot better than the uh, than the Cassandras uh, predict. Let me run a strategy by you, and I am to say I'm I'm not even a novice. I've actually read some of your books. I've actually read Investing in One Lesson that you wrote, and I do want to talk about a Viennese waltz down Wall Street. That's that's a book I mentioned uh, as I was introducing you. I want to mention that a little bit more specifically in a minute. But this is a strategy that I've heard in which 
that's based on the idea that it could be that the stock market could yield you really, really solid returns year in and year out, but that all of a sudden you can get tremendous volatility. And as you say, you can get a case of somebody who invested unwisely and who takes a very, very severe hit to his portfolio. Now, maybe rather than expose myself to that possibility, because who knows where I am in the business cycle at a particular moment, maybe I'm going to start investing at exactly the wrong time. Maybe it would be better to try, to in, in preparing for my retirement, to build up income streams that are not reliant on the stock market. Let's say, I, I know one strategy, for instance, is to buy single-family homes and rent them out and use the rent to pay off the mortgage. And then by the time you retire, they're paid off and they're generating an income stream. And it doesn't matter where the S&P is, you're getting a nice income stream. And then meanwhile, you have some precious metals that just as a, a hedge of one kind or another. And now I'm not exposed to the volatility of the stock market. I may be missing out on really big gains, but I'm also missing out on really big losses. Anything wrong with that? Uh, I think for some people, that's a good strategy. Number one, I would uh, you, you should view gold and silver purchases as an ins insurance, as a hedge, and that means no more than 10% of your portfolio. So that's number one. And number two is, uh, listen, uh, uh, John Schaub is a... Uh, that's the guy I was thinking of, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, he's one of those guys who believes in buying single-family homes, and he's been doing it over the years, and he's been really good at it. Now, the key there is he gets really good renters who stick with him through thick and thin. That's really important, because I've, I've, I've been in the rental... Uh, housing business on. And I, my experience has been very checkered with people who you think are very reliable and then they stop paying their rent. And how do you deal with that? Uh, it's not, it's not as simple as you think in terms of, I mean, it's a full-time business and people need to understand that it's, it's a lot of work. I do a comparison. Here's another alternative and that's to an, invest in real estate investment trusts in the stock market that pay a very generous dividend. Many of them have paid a rising dividend. Uh, let me just give you an example. I've been recommending Omega Healthcare Investors, which is a publicly traded company. It's one of the largest nursing home real estate investment trusts. So it invests in real estate, invests and manages uh, properties uh, that are assisted living uh, nursing homes. Uh, they've increased their dividend 15 times in a row, 15 quarters in a row. They just raised their dividend last month. Now the stock can go up and down. It was actually down a little bit last year. But meanwhile, you continue to get this uh, uh, investment income coming in and you have total liquidity. I mean, when you have real estate and you have to sell your real estate for whatever reason, maybe you have an emergency and so on, uh, there's a downside to that. There's a lot of risk involved in the liquidity problem that you don't have most of the time with the stock market. So there's pros and cons on, on all of these types of things. What I try to do in the stock market is recommend uh, quality companies who pay an above average dividend and pay a, and have a rising dividend policy and that has served me pretty well over the years. I think I've done pretty well with my subscribers uh, using that approach. Can I keep you a little longer than I said I would? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. That'd be fine. I've got to ask you a few more things. All right, let me first pause for a quick message. It's time for the story of poor bad luck Ingrid. She wanted to be an entrepreneur, which today means learning how to use the Internet effectively. So on her own, she tried to learn Facebook advertising, search engine optimization, how to build membership sites, how to collect email addresses and build an email list to contact possible customers, sales funnels, e-commerce, how to use Shopify, how to sell digital products, physical products, how to be an affiliate marketer, how to create digital courses to sell online, and so on. Well, that's not easy to do, and that's what makes her bad luck Ingrid. She didn't know about Chris Record's Group Coaching Academy, where Chris teaches you these things week after week. In my opinion, Chris is the best affiliate marketer out there. He has some of the best products out there. He's an extremely smart entrepreneur. He's got a lot to teach you, plus he's a Ron Paul guy. And he's offering you membership in his group coaching 
for just a dollar for 30 days so you can check it out for yourself. Cut down that learning curve dramatically and learn from the best for just a buck for 30 days to see how you like it. Check it out at tomwoods.com slash buck. All right, I guess the next thing I want to ask you is about forecasting. And it's I, maybe it's a two-part question. Yeah, it's, I think it is a two-part question. Number one, sometimes economists get asked the question, if you know so much about the economy, why aren't you a millionaire? Because they think that understanding supply and demand means you can read the markets. And it seems to me those are two entirely different things. Secondly, can economists forecast, and how do they forecast? Do you think you can manage that in a couple of minutes? <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a very tough business. Even Ludwig von Mises said that it was very difficult. I mean, he was basically a nihilist when it came to predicting things, uh, and, and especially with the uh, with the stock market. How, however, uh, he is famous for having predicted the twenty nine crash. The only problem is that he got out very early. Uh, he recommended uh, selling all stocks, I believe, in like nineteen twenty four or something six years before the stock market actually uh, tanked and the economy collapsed. So he, he, was, a, he was a bit early, and Hayek, uh, same kind of thing. They built their reputation on um, predicting this Great Depression that, that the establishment failed to do. Uh, but both of them were per, what we call perma bears. Uh, both Hayek and Mises were very pessimistic about the future uh, of freedom, uh, even after uh, Hayek was uh, even pessimistic uh, with uh, Thatcher and, and Reagan getting elected. So uh, I think they were tainted by their own history of the early 20th century of two world wars and a Great Depression in between. Um, I think it is possible, and I think it's an obligation for economists to know the signs of the times, to recognize trouble when it comes. Uh, a valuable forecaster is, is really beneficial to predict what's happening. Now, in my book, A Viennese Waltz Down Wall Street, I identify, for example, the inverted yield curve. The yield curve is kind of an Austrian concept of short-term versus long-term interest rates and when the, when you get a short term credit crunch where short term rates are rising uh faster than than the long term rate uh that can be a sign of a recession at long term um so i've i've used that effectively in the past uh, right now we have a positive yield curve even with the fed raising rates so uh i i'm kind of of the opinion that this la latest uh, collapse or, or bear market, if you will, uh, will be relatively short-lived and that we'll, we'll start to see a, a, a bit of a recovery. I don't see it exactly like 2008. In 2008, almost everybody was, uh, uh, was hurt by the collapse in, in real estate prices. Um, there were a few who could benefit from buying, but most people were really hurt by it. In the case of this oil collapse, uh, yes, uh, oil companies, energy companies are largely hurt by this sort of thing, but the rest of the businesses, the rest of the consumers, they're benefiting substantially by these uh, lower rates. And, and you could see an economic recovery just from those. I mean, look at Look at the success of UPS and FedEx and the airlines and so on because of the collapsing oil and fuel prices. So uh, that's why I think I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic by saying I don't think this is going to be a re repeat of 2008. But at the same time, you can't ignore the fact that you had this new technology, uh, the fracking and, and so forth uh, going on. But at the same time, you had this uh, zero interest rate policy, which I think uh, uh, overly uh, encouraged uh, everybody to invest in oil and gas. So there are some elements that are similar to 2008 and, and the late 1990s. So I just don't know how deep it's going to go. And I do know that once we recover from it, uh, we could have another... Uh, another expansion in the recovery phase. 
a couple more quick things. Uh, f- first thing is I get asked once in a while about my opinion on the idea of the Kongratiev wave. Yes. And I saw, see that you wrote a little bit about that in your book. Can you explain what that is and whether it's valid or not? So the Kondratiev wave was based on a Russian economist, uh, Kondratiev, who uh, predicted that capitalism goes through uh, long waves of ups and downs that last 50 to 60 years. And because he was banished by Stalin and eventually, uh, you know, went to the gulag and was killed, uh, he's viewed as a hero. And he must be right because Stalin uh, censored him. The the problem is that these kinds of cycles uh, are based on human action. I go back to Mises. And so while we may forget history and we are doomed to repeat history, it, history is never uh, completely, um, we never go back to the cycle over again. It, it, uh, it, it's just not that repeatable. It may rhyme. There may be some similarities in human behavior that uh, suggest that we can get engaged in exuberance and, and we can get uh, depressed. And so the markets can be, uh, uh, extremely volatile and that sort of thing, but there's no evidence that there is a 50 or 60 year cycle that we must follow follow like we're uh, 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 like our we're, we have our genetic makeup that it goes through that. There's really no evidence of that. So in uh, Viennese down uh, Waltz down Wall Street, I I really join with Murray Rothbard there in criticizing the Kondratiev cycle as uh, as an example of a uh, bad economics. All right. I guess I can't have a conversation. I appreciate that, by the way. That is what I wanted to know. I can't have a full conversation on investing without people writing to me, understandably, saying, well, why didn't you ask, what should I, the average Joe? You must get this all the time. I'm the average Joe. I don't have $10 million to throw around. I have a small amount of money, and I don't know what to do with it. Should I keep it in cash to be safe? Should I try to diversify? What, what does the average Joe do, and how does he know? Well, the self-serving answer would be to subscribe to my newsletter, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is but, a fine you know, answer. There's nothing wrong with that answer. Well, I've been I've I've been writing my newsletter for 36 years, and I I think I've uh, done a pretty good uh, job, and I'm pretty conservative in my approach. I give people choices of individual stocks, uh, mutual funds. Um, I recommend gold and silver coins and so forth. So it's a well-diversified portfolio. On the individual stocks, I try to stay with companies that are making money, have good guidance that are forward-looking in a, in a growing sector like uh, Omega Healthcare that I mentioned before is in the healthcare area and it's in nursing homes and people are living longer and it's an aging population. And uh, this is a company that pays a very generous dividend every quarter, and it's been increasing. Uh, so that that's those are the kinds of investments that I think what I call uh, the uh, swan investments, sleep well at night investments, because the money keeps coming in. And while the stock may go up and down, it's not going to uh, really turn bad on you just because uh, – uh, I mean, every once in a while, you're going to have a bear market, but the overall trend is going to do well. In fact, I heard this is a very interesting example. Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett's fund, Berkshire Hathaway, has lost 50% of its value four times in since its existence, since 1965. That means that Warren Buffett has lost 50% of his net worth four times during his lifetime. And yet today, by staying with it, he's the wealthiest investor in the world. So I think if people realize that I have another wonderful book out that I've sold tons of copies of called The Maxims of Wall Street. And uh, there's some really good advice in there. Like Steve Forbes once said, everybody is a disciplined long-term investor until the market goes down. And that is so often the case that people just can't hold on. So what I try to do is educate people and encourage them to to 
be educated, select good companies that are making money, that are paying dividends and are increasing their dividend. And if you do that uh, in, in the long term, uh, you're going to be quite wealthy. I will link to, uh, is it still forecasts and strategies? Yeah, and uh, if people just go to markscousin.com, uh, they can see information about my newsletter. And then I also have a personal website called mscousin.com, which tells more about gross output and some of my uh, work in, in the economics field. Uh, I didn't know that. I, I see it in the notes now, but I didn't realize you had the two sites. All right. We'll link to both of those at tomwoods.com slash 577. Before I let you go, and of course, I would like to talk to you for another five hours about all this stuff, but tell us about Freedom Fest because you are the mover behind Freedom Fest, the event every year in Las Vegas. Uh, tell us about that because, of course, uh, there's another one coming up this year, as always. Yep, we do it every year. I, uh, we want my idea is to organize the forces of liberty and come together physically once a year, uh, where we can uh, learn from each other, network, uh, socialize, and celebrate liberty or what's left of it. And uh, so we had 2,500 people there uh, this last year. Uh, we even had Donald Trump there, who was quite controversial. He's certainly no libertarian, but we have an op- we we believe in have an open mind and hear what others have to say. But we also had John Mackey and Steve Forbes, and we had uh, uh, Paul Krugman debate Steve Moore. That was really a lot of fun. We have lots of debates, uh, and uh, it's we have an investment conference. We have a film festival. Uh, if people just go to freedomfest.com, uh, they'll be delighted with all of our speakers. We're bringing in George Foreman this year, the heavyweight champion of the world, uh, who fought Ali, and uh, he's also a, a, a very successful entrepreneur with the Foreman Grill, which he sold for $138 million, so he's coming, and uh, we have Judge Andrew Napolitano coming, uh, we have Grover Norquist doing his Wednesday meeting there, uh, we have uh, Richard Fink, who was uh, uh, Charles Koch's uh, right-hand man for 40 years, he's giving the first public speech he's given in 40 years at this year's Freedom Fest. So it's it's pretty exciting, and uh, our early bird special is still in place until January 31st, so uh, now's the time to sign up and, and come join us. It's it's just, you cannot, I mean, David Bowes was telling me the other day, he just can't, from Cato Institute, he can't believe how many people that had, that he, he met that were old friends, and, and he didn't know they were there, and it's just one big party. It's really fun. So it's July 13th through the 16th. We take over the entire Planet Hollywood Hotel in Las Vegas. And if the people just go to freedomfest.com, it'll give them all the details. I will say that I've been at Freedom Fest a couple of times, spoken there a couple of times, and it was a tremendous experience both times. And C-SPAN is there, oh, and yeah. they'll cover a lot of the major talks. So I got on C-SPAN twice just from Freedom Fest, al- actually three times, because then Book TV was there another year, and I yeah. did an interview with them. And I, I, I ended up seeing one of the C-SPAN people uh, at the craps table, actually, later that night. You know, we were just wow. like regular people at that point. Yeah. But there it was you- tremendous, and Bob Murphy spoke in there uh, several Several times, a lot of people oh, yeah. that you would know from listening to my show. Yeah, and uh, we get Stossel. Stossel does his show there every year, and we have Kennedy from Fox Business, and there's just all kinds of people coming. That's just just great. So it it's a fun conference. Uh, everybody loves it. It's created a lot of buzz. So I hope uh, hope to see a lot of you there, and love to have you come back. I would love to make that work uh, w- one of these years. Right now, I'm in. The, I've got the five girls, and it's yeah. I'm, I know. I'm really, I've been really minimizing my story. travel. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. I mean, in the long run, people are going to be glad that I stayed home because I'll produce these five wonderful people, you know, who are going to do a lot of great things in the world. But in the meantime, there are so many things I want to link people to: freedomfest.com, markscousin.com, mscousin.com. I'll just put all of it at tomwoods.com/slash five seventy-seven. Mark, you've been very generous with your time. I'm going to let you get going. Thanks so much for being with me today. Okay, thank you, Tom. All right, a few things before we wrap up this week of shows. The first one is if, you know, I know people look through the episodes and it's hard to believe there are some people who don't listen to every episode. I I, I don't get it, but all right, I understand you have other things to do. That's fine. But people are very discriminating sometimes about which ones they're going to listen to. 
And I think people looked at an episode with North Korea in the title, and they thought, ah, that's too obscure, doesn't matter to me. That was episode 570, 570, How to Respond to North Korea's Nuclear Bluster. If you are one of those people who skipped over that episode, I appeal to you to listen to that episode. You think you don't want to listen to it, but once you're done listening to it, you'll say, you know what? In retrospect, I can say I did want to listen to it. As a matter of fact, I did, I just didn't know it. That is one of the best episodes I've done in a while. And it's Michael Malice, and he's talking about North Korea because he knows an enormous amount about it. He's the one I'd want to have discuss it. And we had a tremendous time, and I learned an awful lot about not just the nuclear program, but about the inner workings of that horrible totalitarian regime. It's a chilling episode in some ways, but it is absolutely not to be missed. So go back on your device and scroll back to episode 570 and make sure you listen to it. That is definitely not one to overlook. Another thing is I want to update you on what fellow Tom Wood Show listeners are up to. We got another couple of websites up and running that I think you might find interesting. Uh, the first one is charmcityconservative.com, and charmcityconservative.com aims to look at urban issues primarily from a libertarian perspective, and there are already a bunch of really interesting and juicy topics up there from that point of view. And that's a that's an area that we could stand to have more commentary. So definitely check out charmcityconservative.com. I'll link to that at tomwoods.com slash 577 as well. Secondly, another listener created the site christianmusicality.com, which is a blog dedicated to contemporary Christian music. So you can check that out at christianmusicality.com. I've got, remember, a bunch of free tutorials for you if you would like to take the plunge and become a blogger yourself. Plus, I'll give you a shout-out for your blog to help get it off the ground for you and link to it on the show notes page for the episode where I mentioned it. You can get this at tomwoods.com slash publicity. And if you are interested in figuring out ways that you might actually be able to monetize your blog, well, then I definitely recommend reading the free ebook by Yaro Starak, who really is the expert on how to do this. He's got some very helpful suggestions for you, and it doesn't cost you a cent to read. You can find that book at tomwoods.com slash Yaro, Y-A-R-O. All right, that's it for this week. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.